She is the probationary lecturer of the Department of Private and Comparative Law. So uh, research interest uh, in human rights at work, contractual dimension of the employment relationship and anti-discrimination law. She's speaking today on the topic of to the break of dawn an exploration of the legal and policy interventions to reduce psychological hazards at workplaces in Sri Lanka. Ms. Naduni Wanika Singha, over to you for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, good morning. So today my research is focused on exploring the effectiveness of the Sri Lankan legislative and uh, policy interventions in reducing the risks uh, faced by private sector workers through heavy workloads and unhealthy work schedules as a growing uh, psychological hazard at workplaces. So I would be first focusing on the uh, on uh, discussing the importance of the management of psychological hazards, and then we'll be uh, uh, we'll be uh, analyzing the effectiveness of primary, secondary, tertiary interventions in uh, managing heavy workloads and unhealthy work schedules as a, a psychological hazard and workplaces. Now, why should these psychological hazards uh, be uh, managed? Why is this a problem? Now, psychological hazards have different physical, social, psychological outcomes. They have various negative physical, social, psychological as outcomes. So considering these different uh, negative impacts of psychological hazards, uh, researchers, policymakers, stakeholders in developed economies are uh, paying, uh, paying their attention on managing psychological hazards. However, still little attention uh, is paid on this regard in uh, developing countries, including Sri Lanka. So understanding this uh, intellectual, intellectual hiatus, my research, uh, I thought of uh, exploring on uh, managing, uh, cycle, uh, managing uh, heavy workloads and unhealthy work schedules as a psychological hazard in workplaces. Now, what are the primary interventions uh, in uh, managing these, uh, managing heavy workloads and unhealthy work schedules? Now, uh, primary interventions are the preventive interventions. Now, when considering the preventive interventions in uh, in, in uh, managing workload and uh, unhealthy work schedules, the flexibility of working time arrangements needs to be analyzed. Now, when considering the working time arrangements uh, of, uh, of private sector workers, Still, uh, the strict, the conventional strict protectionist approach can be seen in Sri Lanka. So uh, basically, the eight-hour conventional, uh, eight-hour working model, model is followed by uh, the labor legislations applied to the private, applied to the private sector workers. So the contextual application, contextual interpretation of these different. Uh, labor legislations suggests, suggests that these labor legislations have narrowed down their scope uh, coverage to the uh, on-site workers and on-site working, and they have uh, ignored geographical, functional uh, flexibility and a typical working arrangement. Now, same uh, protectionist uh, approach can be seen in overtime and nighttime working regulations of Sri Lanka. Now, uh, especially this would apply to the female workers. Now, with these uh, restrictions stimulated by gendered norms and gendered cultural assumptions, uh, the, the workers, especially the female workers, are uh, restricted in selecting uh, their preferred flexible working arrangements. Uh, however, 
this won't be applied to the informal economy. So that is the subsa substantial inequality between formal economy and informal economy in Sri Lanka. Now, employer-oriented flexible working arrangements can be seen in the informal economic sector, but they are non-regulated. So there's a possibility of exploiting workers in these flexible working arrangements. And also, there's uh, there's no uh, there there's uh, no uh, substantial family friendly employment policies uh, strategies in uh, Sri Lanka applying to the uh, to the uh, private sector workers. And uh, and also uh, the over connectivity of workers. Now the right to uh, disconnect from workplaces is left unaddressed um, in the uh, by uh, through the labor legislations and policy interventions in Sri Lanka. So these are the main issues that I have identified in the working time arrangements um, as a preventive intervention in uh, managing workload and unhealthy work schedules in Sri Lanka. Now, when it comes to the investigation and notification of uh, industrial diseases, the uh, Factories Ordinance of Sri Lanka provides uh, guidelines on that regard. Now, still again, these uh, guidelines, these provisions are focused on physical injuries rather than psychological injuries and hazards. So, uh, so this so therefore, uh, there's a necessity of moving towards a multidisciplinary approach in addressing these psychological, in, uh, in uh, managing these psychological hazards. So the proposed Occupational Health and Safety Welfare Act, if implemented, if enacted, would be a very progressive step in uh, preventing these uh, the risks that can be caused due to heavy workloads and unhealthy work schedules in the Sri Lankan legal context. Uh, so uh, now considering the secondary interventions, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health uh, uh, is promoting uh, the physical, mental, social well-being of the workers, and they have uh, this organized. This institute has programs um, targeted on uh, targeted uh, for employers and employees of large-scale industries. And uh, there are two-day level one stress management programs, training programs for such. Uh, industries for such employers and employees of large scale industries. Again, they are only uh, still focusing on large scale industries and uh, small and medium scale industries uh, are given a little attention. So that needs to be these programs needs to be extended for those uh, for those categories too. Now, when it comes to the third year interventions, the compensation me mechanism needs to be uh, needs to be analyzed. Now, workmen's compensation ordinance is the main uh, is the key legislation on com uh, on uh, providing compensation for the workers. Um, uh, uh, caused due to injuries and accidents and workplaces. Now, how can a worker uh, injured due to a psychological hazard or a risk uh, get a compensation uh, through the workers' compensation ordinance? Now, the compensation ordinance uh, is mainly uh, focused on physical injuries and physical hazards. So there's a problem. There's there's a problem of uh, drawing a connection between uh, working schedules and unhealthy working schedules and heavy workloads with injuries caused at workplaces. And this uh, and also now most of the times the injuries caused due to psychological hazards would not have any would uh, would would not uh, would not have any physical symptoms they would be psychological injuries uh, 
without any physical in uh, symptoms so therefore there is a problem of uh, getting compensation for such injuries uh, for such uh, psychological injuries without physical symptoms and therefore there's there there's a problem of connecting uh, or problem of compensating unconventional modern types of workers through the compensation mechanism laid down in the compensation ordinance so therefore uh, creative interpretation is essential in uh, expanding the scope of worker workers compensation ordinance to cover uh, psychological hazards and the injuries caused due to psychological hazards so concluding um, in conclusion um, uh it is important to modify this excessive protectionist labor legislations on working time and working schedules in sri lanka um and uh, the uh, psychological hazards needs to be uh, acknowledged needs to be managed through policy and legislative interventions in the sri lankan legal context thank you Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Naduni Wanigasingha. It's a very interesting presentation on uh, the psychological hazards as workplaces in Sri Lanka. So I would like to uh, turn on uh, our Honorable Justice uh, Sture Raja, sir, sir, for your valuable comments and suggestions for our Ms. Naduni's uh, presentation. I think it's a very, very appropriate topic at an inappropriate time because it's two o'clock, hungry, feeling hungry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, take it in a lighter way. Uh, congratulations, uh, Ms. Nadhuni Vaniga Singha. I know that you are very actively involved in organizing this. Uh, apart from your uh, writing the paper, because I know how many times that you have called me and contacted me. Any of good, great work. Um, saying that um, it is, uh, as I told you, it's a very, very appropriate topic because nobody wants to talk about it because it's too sensitive. The why is it too sensitive is where is the measurement? That is the other problem. If the law needs certain certainty, if you want to pass a law, law needs certain certainty. Because when it comes to the psychological assessment, because we had the same issue with the children's, um, the child rights, the child psychological uh, injuries, we had certain issues. So how do we assess it? Now, for an example, nobody wants to go to a psychiatric because in a simple form, they will say, they will interpret in a completely different way. If you're not feeling well, uh, I mean, if you're getting headache, you go to, you just take a paracetamol or something. If you don't feel, if, you're, if you don't feel well, I mean, psychologically, either you talk to somebody or you just go to a, a, a counselor who can talk to you. But unfortunately, it is not much developed in Sri Lanka. The reason is these people are branded in a different way. So you know, the moment you say that I'm not psychology, I'm not, I'm not uh, mentally feeling well means that they label you as a you are mentally ill. That is the issue because you feel that if you're on a depression, because the word uh, when you say psychological hazards, the main thing comes out in the in the thing is depression in the workload because. You, they, the, especially the female workers, I'm not, uh, this one because they are rather than the male, with all due respect, rather than the male, the female workers in Sri Lankan context has huge multitasking work, saying that they have to work at home, they have to look after the children, they have to work in the office, sometimes they may have to work, do the others work. So when they want to do it, they really bottled up all their problems into them. When they are bottled up, of course, it has to explode at some place. Then the outcome, that is the work outcome, doesn't come in a better way. That I feel it's a psychological hazard. Because I, I, I couldn't go through your full paper because I didn't get it, uh, Ms. Maniga Singh. The abstracts uh, didn't do justice to your paper, I guess. Because uh, your paper would have been much better, I guess, because the way that you presented, the paper was... Uh, paper was very well uh, done. So 
getting back to the subject is how do we assess the the injury because you call it as the injury how do we assess the injury number 2 uh, if we don't assess the injury how do we um, how do we pass the law because in the i'm just coming back to the the child rights because um, in one place it's called mental derangement the word used in the uh, law is mental derangement uh, as a prosecutor i was a prosecutor for a shorter period of about 25 30 years and still i couldn't find it uh, an appropriate case to bring it under the mental derangement because the word singular use it manasika vyakulata abaya so who is going to assess this manasika vyakulata abhi or the mental derangement because that of course they will turn the law when it comes to the court the court want a psychiatric forensic psychiatric uh, consultant if it is a forensic psychiatric consultant obviously there are very very few in sri lanka so can we refer it i'm not deviating the subject uh, mr anika singh that i know uh, that you are in a, you must be wanting you know why i'm thinking of the criminal law i'm talking about the civil law but the problem is the law needs a certainty okay fine would you like to consider so therefore there is some issues there are some problems when you are going to reach passing a law so may i suggest just to consider another two things one is how about work ethical code because in the most of the places in eu which we have found there is a code of ethics or code of conduct they place it in a different term on terminology but um, it's it, there is something if that is violated for an example if a female or a male worker is harassed by the other gender then they immediately have what you call complaining officer in the office itself once it not done so when it complain then they go through it and they try to solve within the area for an example after having a heavy fight obviously you can't sit in front of each other and work in the office so what they do is they will try to consider you to place it in a different desk at least some 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 sort then similarly they have certain other working method to get their uh, work going on to the end of the day the employer has to get the best out of this employees because they invested the money and the employees should have a reasonable work atmosphere because they are virtually spending half or virtually more than half the life in that office because if you take a work they just work more than half the balance uh, quarter they spend on the road the balance quarter they sleep at home so if you take it is almost more than half they are for the work so they should they can reasonably expect a decent working atmosphere the decent comes non harassment also or non uh, hazardous work atmosphere so i might suggest either the code of conduct and code of ethics or code of conduct or code of ethics or maybe both placed in a place and if it is not done so then there is a setup there so they have the internal investigations and everything everything but some of the companies in sri lanka has that 100% so um, once it not done then they refer the matter to the external arbitrator if it is not done then it is referred to the the other authorities like the police labor tribunal uh, labor officers etc etc so that is on one side so then you have some sort of certainty because every small tiny thing that you don't go to the police you don't go to the labor department you don't go to the labor tribunal you don't go to the labor commissioner all sort of things that is one side of it and the other side of it is can we have a clear definition for this psychological has that very tough task you have really endeavored into a, a, a greater area which very few people is uh, they are to get in i may put it the word they are to get in you are being a young uh, probation officer probation lecturer and you have uh, uh, endeavored into a, a huge uh, risky task um 
taking it in the other way, Ms. Vanika Singh, it was uh, nicely done. And I wish that you consider some of these suggestions. And all the very best. Congratulations to start with. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Justice Suray Raja. So thank you very much for your valuable comments. So I'm waiting uh, for you, Mr. Shama Salgado. Madam, over to you for uh, to yes. comment, Ms. Naduni Manikar Singh. Yes. I was really very excited when I saw this uh, uh, bit of work. Congratulations. And I think uh, kudos to you for daring even to go that in that direction because lots of us have wanted to go in that direction, but uh, got a bit diffident, as you know, as uh, Justice himself said, how do you define psychological hazards? And, uh, you know, those are intangible. The mental scars are very difficult to quantify, almost identify. And um, everyone keeps, uh, you know, negative thoughts about someone who might still have psychological um, scars uh, in a workplace. It um, can impact on your career progression, on your personal relationships, on your professional profile, all of that. And uh, we are trying, therefore, you are trying through this research to actually bring that hazard work hazard into the paradigm of occupational safety and health and uh, you know compensation and that whole package of protection of the worker and i really appreciate it because it also veers to protection of the weaker person or we'll say the disempowered woman or the disempowered person who's working with a majority of men and women as perhaps an lgbt person and I think there's a lot of harassment in that direction also. So I think it's a very inclusive bit of legislation that you're talking about in the end. And your research on that is, I would say, an excellent start to something that we are all aspiring to ensure, this inclusivity in the world of work. It lends very well to this at work. I would like to also say that you have, uh, you know, had a threefold approach, the primary care or preventative approach, and then, okay, uh, maybe uh, the preventative approach is almost a zero tolerance approach. Then you come to the uh, secondary approach, which is, okay, once it has started, how to preempt it even at that point of time, and the tertiary approaches perhaps more like after the fact. But for me, I think the primary approach is very, very important. And what you have said in that speaks well to the cliche that prevention is better than cure. Let me see. And uh, I would say push that agenda, go more into research, have an engagement with, again, the uh, at least the social partners in dialogue refers to as social partners, the employers and the workers, get more engaged with them, have a consultative process to enrich your research, come up with some uh, figures, also not only facts, to uh, strengthen this piece of work that you have done and launched on so very well. And uh, the other issue I want to flag for you is you separate context and content. But do you know that if there is somebody who's being very offensive in a workplace, they can fix the content of the work and change the context of your work in such a way that it will be a covered harassment. And you have to look at those things in your paper and address them with uh, perhaps examples and experiences and lessons learned on the ground to speak to the powers so that it becomes a policy paper almost. Action-oriented research for policy change in the labor sector. And it's very salutary because we have, for, and this includes sexual harassment in the workplace. So what you're doing is really super because we have under section 345 of the penal code, sexual harassment interest, and it's considered an offense. However, it's not really in our labor law. And this would be a super entry point to get 
uh, psychological hazards, including sexual harassment in the workplace, as part of the labor law paradigm. And um, that is what I want to tell you. Uh, you have to uh, maybe go a little deeper into the problem, uh, come up with evidence so that it is evidence-based research for policy intervention. Thank you very much for that. It was very interesting reading too. And I was very excited to read this because I mean, I felt that it was well aligned to the work that most of us women are trying to do, especially to get the workplace into an even playing field. And um, thank you. Thank you again. I really enjoyed reading it. And congratulations. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Shama Saga. Thank you very much, Madam. It's really, really appreciate your comments for Ms. Naduni Wanika Singh. Uh, I would like to. Uh, uh, I need. We need to move to the next session. But before we move to the next session, uh, I would like to uh, uh, thank to our honourable distinguished members of the session two. So I'm being honoured. And thankful to our legal luminaries, Honorable Justice S. Ture Raja and uh, Ms. Shama Salgado, to participate in our sessions today as distinguished panel members during their very busy working schedule and uh, during their official commitments. So we, are, we really uh, respect and uh, greatly appreciate both of your thoughts and your contributions given to our presenters in order to develop their research work in future. Thank you very much again, Honorable Justice Esture Raja, Sir, and Ms. Shama Salgado, Ma'am. And we, as the Department of Private and Comparative Law, highly expecting your valuable support in future programs as well of Faculty of Law. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, now uh, we're going to move to our next session, Technical Session 3 of the Department of Private and Comparative Law. We have uh, five presentations, five uh, research papers uh, to present today. Uh, technical Session 3 named as Property Law and Gender Rights. Uh, before going to the presentations, uh, I will take time to uh, have a brief introduction uh, to our distinguished members of the panel today. Uh, we are very warmly welcome Dr. Rose Vijay Sekara and uh, Dr. Yashodara Kadiragama Thambi for our technical session three of Department of Private and Comparative law. Let me introduce each panelist uh, today. Dr. Rose Vijay Sekara, actually, she is our former head of the Department of Private and Comparative Law, and she is currently serving as the head of uh, the law school of Apit Law School, Sri Lanka, and she is the senior lecturer of Department of Private and Comparative Law, Faculty of Law, University of Colombo. And Dr. Rose's uh, research, uh, research specializations on uh, family law, women's rights, child rights, legal philosophy, and gender rights. We are warmly welcome you to the departmental sessions, uh, Dr. Rose Vijay Sekar, Madam. And uh, uh, next we have uh, Dr. Yashodara Kadiragama Tambe. She is uh, the senior lecturer of Department of Legal Studies of Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences of Open University of Sri Lanka. Uh, Madam uh, Kadiragama Thambe's research specializations are law of delict, gender rights, and law of property. Warmly welcome uh, to our technical session, you, Madam uh, Dr. Ashodara. And uh, okay, we'll. Uh, Move, uh, move to the uh, first speaker of the technical session three, uh, Madam uh, Malkanti Aberatna. Uh, she is the senior lecturer of the Department of Private and Comparative Law. 
her research specializations are evidence and criminal procedure and her research interests are uh, property law and intellectual property law, equity and trust law, administrative law, company law, and comparative studies of Roman law. Today, Ms. Malkanti Aberatna, she's speaking on animals, property and law, exploring a way forward. Over to you, Madam Aberatna. My research is on animals, property, and law, exploring a way forward. And uh, my research focuses on the research question, whether detrimental impact on animal interests will have an adverse impact on human interests as well. And it explores the hypothesis that enhancement of animal interests will in turn enhance human interests. The research is both uh, original and timely because the literature review uh, showed that animal interests have not been focused on in Sri Lanka in, the, um, in, legal, in legal writing. And also it is timely because as we all know, uh, we have COVID-19 global pandemic of 2020. Now, COVID-19 is a zoonotic disease, also known as a zoonose. In zoonotic diseases, what happens is a disease that is in an animal is transmitted to a human. That is because the human being comes into contact with the bodily fluids of the infected animal. And what is of gravest concern is when there is a rapid human to human transmission thereafter. Uh, this is not the first time that zoonotic diseases have impacted on the entire world or a segment of it. We had MERS, we had SARS, uh, there is also Ebola, hemorrhagic fever, Spanish influenza. All these have come about because of zoonotic disease, diseases. So uh, bird flu, HIV, the bubonic plague, all these are zoonotic diseases which have had a detrimental impact on human beings. The start of COVID-19 is said to be the wet market uh, in South China, the Hunan seafood market. And uh, this is about perishable goods, the wet market. But in a corner of the wet market, you had a wildlife market where there was um, live meat or what is termed warm meat with on-demand slaughter of animals and skinning of carcasses. So there was obviously a great uh, likelihood of transmission of zoonotic diseases. Sri Lanka is also not a stranger to the eating of uh, the meat of wildlife because the Talagoya, the Releva, the Dandulena and the Gona have often been consumed by uh, people in our society. And our society also has been exposed to zoonotic diseases, not on the scale of, of uh, infection like COVID-19, but leptospirosis or rat fever, dengue, rabies, and uh, ankylostomiasis or hookworm disease. In fact, the hookworm disease regulations was the carrier for the uh, COVID-19 regulations. The most important thing here is the human animal interface and how law deals with that human animal interface. The other important factor that we have to focus on here is that human beings are also animals. And so therefore it is a question of human animal to non-human animal interface actually. There are several big issues surrounding this interface. There is both the legal, the moral, the ethical, the religious, and the scientific. Scientific is important because uh, of what new light is thrown up by new research on animals. T 
two of the most important concepts here is sentience and sapiens. We are homo sapiens, and therefore we have sapiens, the ability to think, reason, wisdom. Sentience is, on the other hand, the capacity to feel, perceive, or experience subjectively. Pleasure, pain, the need for food, water, shelter, freedom of movement, community life, and so on. We felt those very keenly during COVID-19 lockdown. And uh, most animals, nearly all animals, or every animal has sentience according to new research. Now, why have we come about this uh, human-animal interface? Some writers say it's because of what is termed speciesism. And speciesism is where a species, for us, the humans, have uh, demarcated as their species, the human species, as being better than any other species. So it's prejudice based on species alone. And we have focused on distinguishing fe features of humanity, uh, such as high intelligence, a highly complex language, and so on. But we also need to remember that there are segments of our own society, human beings, who actually lack some of those capabilities, but they are treated with respect and care, something that is not accorded to uh, animals. So what is important is how the legal system treats this interface and the balance of power that results. In the legal system, animals are property. So it's within the property law framework. Animals are owned by humans for the economic benefit of humans. So whether it's the Anglo-American common law system where animals are considered to be chattels or personal property, or the civil law tradition, the Roman Dutch law of Sri Lanka, where animals are movable property, rays or things, this balance of power being with the humans is very predominant. And so two primary normative legal entities, as you can see, persons and property. And the interests of persons are protected and animals as property have no interests other than their that of their human owners. And the human owners of animals get to determine the value of the animal property that they own. So as a result, we have instrumental treatment of animals, institutionalized exploitation of animals, whether for companionship, our pets, whether as a biological resource for food or clothing, think of farmed animals and the debacle about the mink farms in Denmark, which happened a couple of uh, weeks ago. Working animals, animals used for scientific experimentation, for entertainment and for hunting and trapping to provide a safer environment for human beings. So how do we arrive at an enlightened treatment of animals? We need to bring in the legal framework. And so the question is, can we actually go beyond mere property? The core purpose of a legal system is protection of the vulnerable. So we should have enough to uh, work with in the legal system. One first step is to work within the framework of property law and uh, to prevent exploitation, cruelty, neglect, and abuse. And um, in this, in Western uh, legal systems, you find uh, areas uh, of concern being highlighted. We, you, they draw inspiration from areas of law other than property law, victimhood, criminal law, uh, animals have been treated as crime victims where they have been abused, neglected, and uh, treated cruelly. Post-conviction possession bans, again from criminal law. Domestic violence protective orders drawn from criminal and family law. Pet custody orders, divorce laws. And then appointed court advocates for animals in cruelty, neglect, and abuse cases anti-tethering laws about tying up of animals, hot car laws, particularly appropriate for our country, but we don't take our dogs and pets in cars. 
uh, hot car la laws where you can't keep animals in closed environments in cars. Then retail pet sale bans to prevent puppy meals, commercial breeding. And at a minimum, anyone who has anything to do with animals have been imposed with requirements to provide basic levels of care, food, water, shelter, and veterinary aid. So duty of care has been imposed and uh, regulatory measures surrounding commercial factory farming uh, about intensive and narrow confinement. Still working within the framework of property law, there is also the much talked about concept of designating animals as living property, still property, but living property because of their sentient nature. And that is uh, according respect for that. Outside of property law, you have the concept of legal personhood drawn from the law of persons. Uh, but here we may have to separate legal personhood from uh, the conceptualization of personhood and humanity. So it's a case by case basis and may not be all attributes of personhood, but why not? Because rivers and mountains in New Zealand and the river Ganges in India have been accorded personhood for protection. And then there is also something that goes really far, animal rights discourse, where you have the abolitionist theory of animal rights, where any sentient being has a basic right not to be treated as the property of others. So it's actually a policy of recognizing and valuing sentient beings. We have in Sri Lanka a Buddhist heritage coming of Arahat Mahinda, or tied up with animals and the hunting of deer, historical heritage of King Buddha Dasa, the physician king who also treated animals, the um, evocative story of the snake being cured. Our Roman Dutch law um, provided for animals as property, as rays or things, and you also had the Actio de Pauperi and the Actio Legis Aquiliae. What about our welfare legislation? Animal welfare legislation is very patchy and far between. Principal Act is the Animals Act of 1958. It deals with a motley collection of animal related activities, as you can see transportation, branding, trespass, and breeding. Butcher's ordinance, principally dealing with slaughterhouses. Then prevention of cruelty to animals ordinance, which extraordinarily talks about unnecessary pain or suffering. Can pain or suffering ever be necessary? You have the municipal council's ordinance, which provides for stray cattle and pigs on the street and offensive trades. Nuisances ordinance about unwholesome meat being sold. Gaming ordinance where cockfighting uh, is uh, taken as amounting to gaming. And of course, the famous fauna and flora protection, which is mainly about commercial exploitation. Then uh, going forward for us in Sri Lanka, we need to think more about enhancing animal rights, but it's not a smooth path. Because for us, we have the issue of animal sacrifice, the use of bull hooks to uh, control large animals such as elephants, which brings us into the arena of the Perahara. We have farmed animals, we have working animals, and of course we have our zoos uh, and our habit of gifting elephants as um, you know, uh, nation to nation gifts. And now one of our elephants, Carbon, who was in Pakistan, has been freed and is in Cambodia. So it's not an easy path as you can see. But it's a path that we should and must travel on. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Malkanti Abhayaratne, for a very interesting presentation on animal and 
property uh, rights. So I would like to uh, go for the um, discussion forum now. So first, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Rose Vijay Sekara to make the comments and suggestions over Ms. Malkanti Abhayaratna's presentation. Over to you, madam. Thank you, Kaushani. Um, thank you, Ms. Malkanti, for a, for a very interesting uh, uh, presentation and selecting a very interesting topic. I was, uh, I just had a brief look at your abstract. Um, now, after reading your abstract, I thought your presentation slightly differed from uh, the contents in the abstract, but of course, how can you ex express an idea within 300 or 350 words? So um, you made the research problem and the hypothesis very clear. I was just wondering whether you are trying to take animals uh, from the position of property, mere property to a to a status beyond beyond being mere property to a status of living property. Uh, if you can explain a little bit on the rationale that you would use in order to justify the rights of animals, because the basis for my question uh, arises from this uh, complexity that I was having in my mind. Now, if you take animals as a property, you know, property can be owned by any anybody. And that property cannot claim rights. But if you take animals above that position as a holder or holders of rights, then of course you have to recognize all animals, animals on air, animals in water, animals on land, as a species, as you describe, as a species who, who should be given rights. Is that your basis? Are you adopting a rights basis to your thesis or do you adopt something else that you did not explain in your in your uh, presentation because if you are talking about rights then of course uh, we have to we can't uh, differentiate between uh, big animals like uh, elephants or uh, the pet, the animals that we keep as pets only because we have to incorporate all species. So if you can please explain us a little bit more. Let me unmute myself. I hope you can hear me, Rose. Yes, Rose, you raise the most important point in looking at animals and uh, it's specifically because of what you raised about the concept of rights that I did not use the word rights in animal rights, property and law. I didn't use the word rights there because that difficulty is there because when you accord rights, uh, one, who's going to activate that right? Because when you have a right, you should be able to enforce it. You, you, you have to follow up on it. So an animal can't do that. Now, Carvan the elephant can't march into court and demand that, you know, please free me. That doesn't happen. Someone has to work on his behalf. So that's why I traced that continuum within property as well as what writers do. Uh, like Gary Francio and a, a large number of writers do talk about animal rights. And if you look at the arena, the landscape, even in Sri Lanka, you have animal rights activists, people who are really searching for a better deal, if I may put it that way, for animals. And so you um, also pinpointed the concept which I used of living property. Now there, what you would seek to do is you're still within the property uh, 
rights a property law framework but you're distinguishing an animal from say something like a mere table or a chair because a mere table or a chair it doesn't have life doesn't feel pain so within the property law concept itself you are separating out a category for animals because they have life now we may not come to the point of say rights because it's it's difficult who's going to uh, you know make sure that the rights are afforded of course we can travel the same area the same path that you are also familiar with what about children the children would have the parents the courts as upper guardian so there is already a uh, a strand of thinking in law itself that uh, we might be able to use but you see we have all got so used to the fact that this is ours this is property we can do what we like with it and that's why i mentioned denmark as well about 3 million 3 million mink little animals like little you know fairly big but not as big as say uh, a cat or a dog uh were killed were killed in denmark about 2 to 3 weeks ago simply because they got covid and a different strain of covid so because they were part of farming farmed animals for mink coats so they were just killed So you got rid of COVID, this uh, this aberration of COVID, by killing three million mink, and there was a huge problem thereafter about burying. But never mind that. But so you see, um, do we, as animals ourselves, uh, forget to use our sapience or our reasoning, and thereby think only of ourselves? and this is a part of sustainable development this is a part of environmental protection do we also realize that we also have to be trustees of animals as well so it's a difficult part arriving at the concept of animal rights is not an easy part it's a very very difficult one and that's why you may have stages within it where you may move to better treatment of animals to actually designating them as living property and then perhaps even personhood if you can designate a river and a mountain as a legal person for the purpose of protecting that uh, entity now it's an entity uh why can't you extend it to i mean the river doesn't feel pain the river doesn't feel hunger you might say that uh for the river and the mountain in new zealand and for the river ganges in india it's spiritual there is a spiritual aspect to that protection so that perhaps is what is actually being safeguarded because the river and the mountain in new zealand are important to the maori people and ganges is important in hinduism so there is the human being which might protect it might come up to support cases in respect of it but for animals it's going to be very very difficult now in the animal welfare bill which you know is still not seeing the light of day they suggested a sort of a, a panel of trustees who might take care of it i think it causes a lot of difficulty that's why 2006 to 2010 20 we still haven't seen anything on animal welfare but thank you you asked a very very interesting question which helped to expand and i really do value that because um that's important i think to realize that how difficult this path is going to be Thank you Ms Malkanti. So in conclusion even though the research is ongoing in at least for the moment uh, the man made legal system still maintains its superiority over correct, over animals correct. as well as over property. Thank you very much. Right.
Thank you, Roshan. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ross Vijayasekara. Thank you very much, Madam, for your very valuable uh, comments uh, regarding uh, Ms. Malkanti Abhiratna's presentation. And now I would like to uh, uh, invite uh, Dr. Yashodara Kadiragama Tambe uh, for uh, the com uh, her comments uh, regarding Madam Abhiratna's presentation. Over to you, Madam. Very presentation. It's a timely. And I have few comments like I just uh, after, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Rose asked a question, then you explain and I'm clear now. Actually, I think you are more focusing on the welfare of the animals. So I just uh, I just uh, asking you because based on your research questions and looking at the methodology, I think it's your you have followed the doctrinal method. So I would like to just suggest Malkanti because there is not much research is done in even in Sri Lanka uh, in this aspect. So why don't you go beyond non-doctrinal research methodology where you can, you know, go interviews and questionnaire. Like there are a lot of organizations, individuals work on animal welfare. So I think because uh, because now uh, you have, you know, explained the gaps in our present law, we, it is not giving much importance to, you know, welfare of the animal. So therefore, what I feel is that you can go beyond the doctrinal uh, part of your research methodology. And I would like to also ask, like you have mentioned some, you know, examples Examples from Western, you know, Western countries, how these uh, they uh, welfare the animals are protected. So I wondering. So I just know the reason why you have just taken only the Western, you know, uh, uh, perspective. So is there any room, you know, you can develop like even in de we are a developing country. So why don't we look at in some other, you know, developing countries where how maybe like in India or uh, the uh, in South Asian context. Uh, how these when, uh, welfare of the animal is looking after by the legislations. So those are my comments, uh, Markanti. Thank you. And yeah, thank you. That's all. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ashwadara Khadiragam Thambe. Thank you very much for your valuable comments. So I will go for the next uh, presentation. Uh, Ms. J. Kala Jairendram. Uh, she is the probationary lecturer of the Department of Private and Comparative Law. Uh, her research interests are in uh, law of interpretation and statutes and documents, and law of contract and environmental law. She is presented today on the topic of comparative analysis on the role of the judiciary in protecting the rights of nature in Sri Lanka. Ms. Jaikala Jairentram, over to you. analysis on the role of the judiciary in protecting the rights of nature in Sri Lanka. The globe and its creatures not only belong to the human beings but belong to the entire diversified ecosystem in common. Humans also share the globe with its other creatures and nothing is superior to the other. This concept was not correctly understood in many occasions and the man-made activities for their development purposes destroy and affect the environment very badly. This research intends to examine the importance to provide and protect the rights of nature in Sri Lanka. The main objective is the research. Uh, the main objective of the research is to evaluate the existing legal framework of the law relating to environmental protection in Sri Lanka and to examine the best possible ways to incorporate modern developments in rights of nature by judicial interpretation. Sri Lanka has a rich ecosystem diversity due to different climate, soil, and other geographical conditions. The legal framework relating to environmental protection is also broad in this country. However, it is observed that these protections available under the legal framework are only ensured by uh, leg, um, actions brought by natural or legal persons. Therefore, nature has no say when its rights are violated by human activities. Although recognizing the rights of nature will require new legislations, recognizing the nature as a legal personality through judicial interpretation as a first move uh, in Sri Lanka will help to protect and preserve the ecosystem diversity in the country. 
Sri Lanka is a developing country where tension between economic development and environmental protection is inevitable. Decided cases evident that uh, the fact some of the administrative decisions only focus on economic development and in this occasions, judiciary plays a major role in ensuring environmental protection in order to move towards a more sustainable economic development. What is rights of nature for justice? As correctly pointed out by Professor Christopher D. Stone, likewise, co co uh, companies, corporations, states, estates are given legal personalities. Even though they cannot speak, lawyers speak on behalf of them. Therefore, it can be um, arguable, it can it is arguable that nature can also be given legal personality. Sri Lanka's ecosystem diversity is a part of the livelihood of its people. Thus, rights of population in the country contribute to a speedy urbanization process and lead to overuse of natural resources and harm the nature. Why judicial interpretation is important in protecting the rights of nature in Sri Lanka. We have uh, a rich number of legislations to protect the environment. On the other hand, the judiciary's role to protect the environment as a guardian is uh, uh, remarkable through decided cases. Though there are number of numerous legislations available, the judiciary's role evident that um, they act as guardians to protect the environment. The role of judiciary in environmental protection in Sri Lanka. Right to life or right to a healthy environment is not expressly provided under the constitution of Sri Lanka, which is the supreme law of the country. However, it is observed that the judiciary of Sri Lanka has guaranteed right to life and right to a healthy environment by interpreting the provisions of the constitution in many decided cases. There are two set of references can be identified in the constitution relating to environment. First is the fundamental rights chapter and the second is chapter on directed principles of state policies of, uh, and fundamental duties. Under the fundamental rights chapter, Environmental justice upon the applications made by the affected individuals or the non-governmental organizations along with the affected parties are uh, brought under the fundamental rights chapter. However, the fundamental rights or the state directive principles are being used to protect the environment for the people as they are depending on it and not as a right of the nature. Therefore, it appears important to allow the nature to protect itself through accessing the codes without waiting for someone who is directly affected by the harm caused to nature to file an action for the nature. Legal recognition for rights of nature in India. India has a diversified ecosystem like Sri Lanka and the role of judiciary in protecting the environment is remarkable through landmark judgments. Although the nature was not provided or a given express recognition of legal personality in India, uh, the approaches of the judiciary towards protecting the nature of, um, and guaranteeing its rights are impressive. In the decided case of Welfare Board of India versus Nagaraja and others, it was stated that right to dignity and fair treatment is therefore not confined to human beings alone, but to animals as well. In another decided case of State of Gujarat versus um, Mizapur, Moti, Qureshi, and others, it was expressed. Article 51A, subarticle G of the Constitution, was interpreted by stating that it is a fundamental duty of every citizen in India to, compa to have compassion for living creatures. In the case of TN Bodhavarman, Tirumulpat versus Union of India, it was uh, expressed that environmental justice could be achieved only if we drift away from the principle of anthropocentric to ecocentric. It enumerates that the courts in India have taken steps to protect the rights of other creatures in the country from human activities. It is observed from the discussion that legal personhood has not and should not be restricted to human beings only. Hence, directly or indirectly, the judiciary 
in India seem to contribute in the protection of the nature and its rights by giving legal recognition to the parts of nature through decided cases. Sri Lankan courts have long history in introducing and applying the legal principles introduced by Indian courts and refer to Indian judgments. Therefore, it can be recommended that the judiciary in Sri Lanka could contribute to protect the nature and its rights through judicial interpretation under the existing legal framework in the absence of separate legislation on this matter. Constitutional recognition for rights of nature under the uh, constitutional uh, constitution of Ecuador. Constitution of the Republic of Ecuador 2008 is the first in the world to declare nature as subject with rights. It is observed that the right to a healthy environment and protection of the ecosystem are expressly guaranteed under the Constitution. Article 71 of the Constitution provides that all persons, communities, peoples and nations can call upon public authorities to enforce the rights of nature. The constitutional recognition for rights of nature under the uh, constitution, under their constitution, gives an idea as to the importance of protecting the nature like other creatures in the ecosystem. Therefore, it is recommended that protecting the rights of nature can be achieved by incorporating provisions relating to this matter through the amendment to the constitution in Sri Lanka as it is the supreme law of the country. As the judicial history of Sri Lanka evident that the judiciary did not stick to textualism where the plain meaning to the provisions lead to injustice and the courts have adopted a purposive approach to bring about justice. This approach can be followed to introduce the rights of nature in Sri Lanka under the existing legal framework in the absence of a separate legal provision. This paper concludes by stating that Recognizing the nature or some part of the natural world as having legal personality through judicial interpretation is an inevitable move in today's world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jayakala Jairendram, for your presentation. Uh, I would like to uh, go for the comments of uh, Dr. Rose uh, Vijay Sekara regarding uh, Mr. Jayakala's presentation. Madam, uh, over to you. Thank you, Jayakala, for a wonderful presentation. Congratulations. Uh, so it's so it's it's really really nice to see you all uh, presenting on wider topics. Though your your uh, abstract your your the concept looks very uh, limited it is not because the idea behind your main research problem is huge on the one hand it's quite innocent i would say but on the other hand it's very very powerful to recognize nature itself as a rights holder I was now wondering when you started presenting, why should we protect the nature? Is it because uh, people, human beings require the uh, nature? Is that why we should protect the nature? Or should we protect the nature for its own benefit, for its own right? And on the other hand, the, the second element of your research is the judicial interpretation, the role of the judiciary in protecting the nature. You know, judiciary consists of human beings. Therefore, their interpretations are very much subjective. Unless the judiciary recognizes nature as a rights holder, they can do disasters through their judgments. And you know very well, when you say judicial construction, it consists of construction or the interpretation of the, the substance of the law, which is very much influenced by the structure of the law and the culture of the law. So when you say judicial construction of something, it, it includes all these aspects. So, 
So the judiciary, the entire legal system, the substance, the culture and the structure of the legal system should recognize nature as a rights holder. It's it's a beautiful idea, Jackala. Congratulations. Thank you very much. For well. having courage to, to come up with such a such a strong idea. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ross Jessica. I hope uh, Ms. Jaikala will be really happy uh, out of uh, Dr. Ross's comments. It's really, really interesting. So I will uh, uh, go for Dr. Ashodara Kadiragamatambe. Madam, uh, uh, over to you for comments uh, regarding Ms. Jaikala's presentation. Madam, uh, kindly uh, switch on your mic if possible, please. Uh, thank you. Right. Uh, I'll just make a quick, uh, uh, because we are running out of time, I think. Uh, I think I just want to mention, Jayakara, that uh, when you compare with India and Sri Lanka, because Article 21 is there, actually it paved the way for the judiciary, Indian judiciary to, you know, go for progressive realization of these uh, judicial I mean, interpretations. So that is one thing. I think you have mentioned in your presentations that the constitution should be amended, uh, but I couldn't see what are the specific amendments that you are suggesting. Maybe you, are, so you might have suggested in the paper, but I couldn't see uh, the one. And the, again, I think you have to appreciate the Indian judiciary also because directive principles of state policy we just merely consider as guidelines, but when you take Indian judiciary, they actually think it's part of the Indian constitution. It's kind of they are giving a equal positions with fundamental rights jurisdiction. And also I would like one more comment. When you make a comparison with some other countries, it's better just to give a justification why you have taken those two countries. So that's all my comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam. Thank you, Thank you very much, Madam uh, uh, Yashodara. Uh, so we'll move into the next uh, presentation. Uh, this present is Ms. Uh, Satya Seelan Janani, Ms. Janani. So Ms. Janani is the probationary lecturer of the Department of Private and Comparative Law, and her research interests are in private international law, uh, information technology law, new trends of contracts under information technology era, and land law. So today she is speaking on global rights to lands, need for the recognition of the rights to lands with the emergence of private international law. I hope the presentation will be very interesting. So over to you, Janani. Janani, you are muted. Janani, we can't uh, hear you. Yes, madam. Uh, give, give us a little time, madam. Wait. based on recognizing the global rights to land in front of a panel who are already in the top of this research area. The global rights to land need for the recognition of right to lands with the emergence of private international law. Before I take you into the study of this research, I would like to familiarize you into the two key phrases that I have used throughout my research area. One is private international law. Private international law is a branch of jurisprudence arising from the diverse laws of various nations that applies when private citizens of different countries interact or transact business with one another. And also, it refers to the part of law that is administered between private citizens of different countries 
is concerned with the definition, regulation, and enforcement of rights in situations where both the persons in whom the right incurs and the person upon whom the obligation rests are private citizens of different nations. Thus, it is a set of rules and regulations that are established or agreed upon by the citizens of different nations who privately enter into a transaction and that will govern in the event of a dispute. In this respect, private international law differs from public international law, which is the set of rules entered into by the government of various countries that determine the rights and regulate the intercourse of different nations. And second is the global right to lands. This phrase has been used throughout the study to refer the inalienable ability of individual to freely obtain, use, and possess the lands at their discretion without any discrimination, even without the barriers of citizenship, as long as their activities on the land do not impede on other individuals. But does the right to land actually exist under international law? The traditional answer to this question would be no. As it was held in the case of Johnson's versus M. Itosh, the right to lands, especially, is and must be admitted to depend entirely on the law of nation in which they lie. As a matter of public international law, the domain power over the lands always vested within the ambit of state sovereignty. And it is believed that the sovereignty of a state is vested upon the exclusiveness of one such state to regulate its own laws and rules to the matters connected to the rights and obligations of lands. The states are always vested with the domain power over the land situated within its territory. Even the existing government of a state has the right to acquire the lands which are under private ownership, and this has been held and upheld by a series of case laws in various states. Therefore, the international society did not envisage for a separate branch of laws which governs the land rights. Even this conventional notion also has been supported by the jurisprudence of legal positivism, where it depends that the lands exist only to the extent recognized by the national government. In this sense of legal positivism, the land law stems from a vertical relationship between the state and its citizens. However, the development and the advancement of private international law has led to the emergence of a new trend in recognizing land rights, and thus the concept of global right to lands has emerged along with several debates by rewriting and redrafting this conventional notion. The research problem in this study has entirely been a matter of recognition. In the field of international law, the existence of a right, obligation, or an entitlement is always has been a matter of recognition. But although the private international law has led to the emergence of the concept of global right to lands and stresses the need for its recognition, there are such profound legal implications that expressly recognize the global right to lands and the interests connected to land rights. And still, almost many of the states expressly deny or restrict the right to lands when there is a foreign element or a foreigner is involved in a particular land transaction. For example, the Land Restriction on Alienation Act number 38 of 2014 of Sri Lanka would be a best example for this. Meanwhile, on the other hand, many countries even do not recognize the land rights at least at their national levels. Although the existence of international law uh, 
regime does not provide for the express recognition to the land rights. Now that the need has arose, it is assumed that the recognition could be supported by the right-based approach to the legal jurisprudence held as the hypothesis of this research. And also, the main idea behind this study was to make a theoretical contribution to the existing legal domain by introducing the concept of global right to lands. But apart from introducing the concept, it was also aimed to analyze the feasibility of recognizing the concept in the sphere of private international. As a main idea behind this research was to provide a normative value by the of a theoretical contribution. The research was mainly based on the doctrinal method of legal research and the use of legal theories were utilized to provide a jurisprudential and a theoretical background to justify the hypothesis of the research. And in order to attain the objective of the research, the following questions were well examined during the study of this research. The first one was whether and to what extent the need for the recognition of global right to land exists. And the second was what will be the underlying principle upon which the global right to land will be given its legal recognition. And sec third one, what will be the effect of the global right to lands if the legal recognition is given to this concept. And in lining with the first research question, the, find, the first finding to this study is that since the foreign courts under private international have, law, have, law have to deal with the rights and interests of the peoples of different nations, it is essential to ensure that the parties are vested within those rights at the first instance. Thus, in a situation where the disputes arise with regard to the interest of rights connected to lands among the citizens of two different nations, the right to lands should be available to both parties at the time of the dispute in order to obtain a just order or a determination. Therefore, there is a necessary implication for the need of recognizing the global right to lands. And several other factors to have led to the need for recognizing the global right to land, namely the effect of globalization, the development of, of the culture of dual citizenship, migration, whether it could be temporary, permanent, or work-based. And finally, and most importantly, the cross-border investment and cross-border trade activities. Rationalizing the concept through right-based approaches was the third uh, finding of this research. And this was the most significant finding of the research where it was based on the second question to the research area and also which this validates the hypothesis of the research. There are several steps that has been already taken by a favor of the international instrument to recognize the rights to property as a substantial human right which can be utilized to recognize the land rights by giving a creative interpretation. For example, Article 17 of the 19 48 Universal Declaration of Human Rights declares that everyone has a right to own property alone as well as in association with others, and no one shall be arbitrarily deprived of this property. However, it is noteworthy that the enforcement of international land law through human rights norms presents too many challenges. And also, they do not specifically deal with land rights. They merely uh, deal with the property rights in, a, in other hand. And also, on the other hand, still the existing human right rules are subjected to the sovereign right of each individual state. But the fourth finding to the, uh, finding to the research 
uh, evident that it is uh, evident that there are few examples of international conventions that are already functioning with the coordination of several states in terms of property rights, which can be implied apply to the matters concerned to lands by giving a creative interpretation. Such global standards have had been created in relation to the creation of bills in tested succession, estate administration, trust, and marital property. By stressing the importance of recognizing the concept of global right to land again in this presentation, I will finally conclude my presentation by making the implication to the effects of recognizing the global rights to land. Thus, recognizing the global rights to lands will create a set of uniform and harmonized rules in private international law. Either it could be expressed or implied, can be in, uh, applied for the land disputes where private individuals are concerned. And second, it will provide a mechanism to recognize the rights to land even at the national level of the states. And it will mitigate the arbitrary acquisition of land. Thus, this will lead to the uh, this will lead to implement a public policy endorsed by the global community when the states tend to exercise the eminent domain power when they acquire or acquire private owned lands. However, it is also important to note that, on the other hand, recognizing the concept of global right to lands will necessarily restrict the scope of the traditional norms on the sovereignty of each state. Saying that, I will finally conclude uh, my presentation at this juncture, and I am thankful for listening to me uh, during this short time period and also I, I will I would I would like to thank for giving me the opportunity to present at this forum. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Janani. Uh, it's uh, really interesting on private international law and uh, the global uh, rights on lands. So I would like to uh, uh, have listen to uh, Dr. Ross Vijay Sekar first uh, regarding uh, Ms. Janani's presentation. Madam, over to you. Uh, thank you, Janani. Thank you. Uh, it was a very good presentation. And uh, as uh, Kaushani pointed out, you, do, you have touched uh, a very important aspect of law, private international law. And uh, in private international law, uh, I know this aspect has not been addressed adequately. Uh, Dr. Yashodhara will have uh, more to add to your presentation, but just to uh, share my thoughts uh, on this area. I don't agree with Article 17 of the UDHR uh, because uh, sustainability and justice require that nobody should be able to own property. Because if you let anybody own something, uh, that means that he or she or they can do whatever they want with the property, with whatever they, so with the property, uh, land specifically. Because it's such a, such an important asset. The entire humanity should be able to enjoy. So if we allow individuals or communities own that uh, the future generations may find may 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 face to uh, uh, face consequences that are against justice so i mean we know i'm sure you 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 are aware of john Rawls' concept of justice uh, saving for the future generations is one important uh, concept of justice. So sustainable development, which is reflected in the 2030 Global Development Agenda, is that is based on the concept of justice, 
just savings principle. So if you just, uh, I would suggest that instead of using right to land, how about using rights in land? Uh, yes, Madam. Uh, even I wanted to emphasize on the all the rights which are connected to lands, not only the possession or the ownership. Right. All, all right. the other exclusive rights of lands. Thank Good. you, Madam. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ross Vijay Sekar. It's a nice comment, actually. And uh, uh, Dr. Yashodara Kadiragama Kambe, over to you for the uh, make the comments on journalist presentation. I think you were you were eagerly waiting uh, for uh, the her presentation. <laughs> so over to you. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, Janani, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. I do agree with Dr. Uh, Ross Vijay Sekar. Uh, because this concept of sustainability and things. Um, but I would like to make a, a, a very specific, I have to ask two questions because one is that you, uh, uh, you are in your presentation, your paper also agreed that international law so far, you know, does not recognize the uh, right to land. I think uh, Dr. Yashodara unexpectedly faced some uh, connection errors, maybe. Uh, so uh, shall we uh, uh, just uh, wait? Janani can answer, no? Janani can respond if you are willing to. Uh, so, madam, uh, but the question was not clear to me, madam. I didn't hear the question. Uh, let me check with uh, uh, Dr. Kadira Gamatambi. Just give me a few minutes. Yes, ma'am. I hope uh, there's a power failure uh, regard uh, on uh, Dr. Kadre Gamatambe's uh, place. So because of that, she left uh, uh, left from the session. So we'll have her. We'll, we'll try to co contact her, uh, reconnect her soon, and uh, take uh, your comments uh, regarding Janani's presentation. So uh, so we'll wait for that thing. So uh, until then, we'll move to the next uh, session, next uh, presenter. Uh, Ms. Buddhika Munasingha. Uh, she's the probationary lecturer of the Department of Private and Comparative Law, and her research interests are in land law, law of property, human rights, and Roman law. She is presenting today on the topic of critical analysis of the law relating to human billboard in and the evolution of the concept of commodification of human skin. Over to you, Ms. Buddhika, uh, for to presentation. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor to have the opportunity to address such a distinguished audience. Let me introduce myself. I am Buddhika Munasingha. What I'd like to present to you today is about the law relating to human will body. As you can see on the screen, my topic today is critical analysis of the law relating to human will body and the evolution of the concept of the commodification of human skin. I'd like to start this presentation with two stories of the world of the human will borders. The first one is about Billy Gabby. Billy has a wife and five kids to feed. Therefore, now he is working as a human will border or a skin vertizer to a company named Postergator.com. Aside from Postergator, he also has a number of other websites, mostly defined tattooed all over his body. Not only does he have Postergate.com tattooed on him, but he has also legally changed his name to Postergator.com in 2011. You can see his new identity card on the screen. It reportedly cost to the company 
fifteen thousand dollars for this unusual advertisement stunt, according to the B. He said that he did all these things because he wanted to save his family. Let's move on to the second scenario. In October 2011, two graduating Oxford University students launched a project for a private company named Buy My Face, through which the advertisers could pay to promote their businesses, products, or services by having their brands painted on the students' faces while the students committed to using revenues to pay off their students' debt. The second scenario all these scenarios shows the tendency of using human bodies as canvases for advertising messages and branding even though these things will be inevitably leads to the downfall of the civilization. Therefore, this presentation is structured as follows. Firstly, I'd like to provide very brief introduction about the concept of human billboarding, and then I'd like to describe research problems, research objectives, and limitations of the research. After that, I'd be looking at the research methodology, and then I'd like to discuss the law relating to human skin as advertising space and the conflict of laws relating to the human skin. So, Human billboards have been around for centuries, but their presence and the form today differs somewhat from their historical predecessors. A human billboard can identify as some person who put on an advertisement on his or her person. This can be practicing via someone holding or wearing a sign of some sort, but also this can be include someone wearing advertising as clothing or food point. This human billboarding can be practiced by having advertising tattooed on the human body. In the trade literature, human body has been used to refer to a widely array of advertising techniques that in the several ways transaction to the body boundaries between the human from the advertisement. As we discussed earlier, even though the still there has been some kind of immense commercial communicating potential and the consumer attractions in the human body or human skill, human skin, at the end of this process, human body becomes the medium that carries the advertising messages. This leads to the concept of the commodification of human skin. Therefore, the research problem can be identified as follows. Do the existing legal frameworks provide an adequate protection against the commercialization of human skin via skin billboarding to ensure the rights of the human holder, human skin holders by providing the full enjoyment of human rights and how the conflict of laws over the human skin finally affects the concept of individual autonomy and the right to bodily integrity. This research limits itself only to consider the laws in the United States of America and the United Kingdom. Those countries have developed cultural culture of human skin billboard in as a newly recognized green way of advertising methods. The main purpose of this research is to explain the problematic nature of the existing laws relating to the human skin billboarding and to make effective recommendations to ensure the rights to skin holders who agree to act as skin billboarders and also i'd like to mention how this conflict of laws over human skin finally affected the concept of individual autonomy and the right to bodily integrity i'd now like to move on to the research methodology Basically, this is a qualitative research, so I mainly focused on the secondary sources like legislation, case laws, international conventions, law reports, and the electronic databases. So let's move on to the discussion of this research. Basically, this research is based on the concept of human billboarding, which can be identified as a concept with use the human body as a space for an advertising purposes. Generally, human skin is the largest organ in the human body. People use this human skin for various purposes. Some people use human skin as a mode of expression, but on the other hand, some people use human skin as a commercial property. So in this scenario, it is very important to identify that law should be looking into these issues very deeply. First of all, I'd like to consider the history of these laws or the practices led to the human skin as a mode of expression, especially in the ancient Romans and Greeks used tattooing to penalize slaves, criminals, and prisoners of war. At the same time, some people used tattooing for spiritual and decorative purposes. 
However, in the modern era, people started to directly deal with the concept of the commodification of human biological materials, including human skin, with the advancement of the science and the technology. The concept of human skin billboarding and using disembodied human skin in various productions by companies also directly connected with the commodification of human skin. In this context, human skin billboarding the seller's skin transformed into a commercial space which has alienable economical property rights. Those can be enjoyed by the third parties via agreements. And in the context of using disembodied human skin happened via commercial agreements or transactions between bio companies and hospitals or tissue banks. But this approach of alienability of human skin hasn't had legal validity because of the notion in alienability of the human biological materials via commercial transactions, which questioned the theory of the individual bodily integrity widely accepted and highly prized social norms, even though there are some property rights granted over creations based on the human skin under the, property, under the copyright law regime. However, this paper intends to discuss all these happenings very deeply. Here you can see some kind of examples happening in the modern era with regarding to the human skin billboarding. Apart from these examples, there is a rich case for jurisdictions which accepting no property laws in the human body. Moore versus Regents of University of California is the best example for that. However, in the recent case of Earworth and others versus North Bristol in trust, the Court of Appeal for England and Wales revisited the property debate and threw into a doubt several doctrines with respect to a property and the body. Even though this approach clearly away towards the notion of the commodification of human biological materials by granting property rights to the human body in the exceptional circumstances, it is not universally accepted yet. If we trace into the current law relating to the non commodification of human skin, there are most notable provisions and laws protect the concept of the commodification of human body and its body parts apart from the case law jurisdiction. According to the Human Tissue Act of United Kingdom, no one can buy, sell or otherwise deal directly or indirectly with the human biological materials other than the blood. Also, the no property rights in the human rights also protects from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Universal Declaration of on Bioethics and Human Rights. However, even though there are laws and policies relating to the concept of prohibition of the commodification of human biological materials, at the same time, the lawmakers provide property law rights over human biological materials, which goes to the commodification of human skin by granting intellectual property rights over human biological materials under the patent and copyright law regimes or recognize human skin as a tangible medium of expression under the copyright and granting patent rights to the human biological materials which subject to human labor and skill under the section one or two of the copyright act of the united states of america grants copyrights over the tattoos and this has been identified in several case laws including cartoon network lp versus csc holding incorporation this case status that a tangible medium of expression can be a paper canvas wall or even skin Therefore, arguably most notable cases which relate into the tattoos also accept the right copyright over the human tissue skin. Warner Brothers Studio and Mike Tyson's tattoo case is a very famous case that a court granted a copyright copyright to the Mike Tyson's tattoo artist. Now you can see there is a huge gap between laws relating to the human billboarding and the laws relating to the human biomaterials. Therefore, I'd like to present few solutions that can be recognized as proposed recommendations. First of all, there should be a specific law or regulatory framework to resolve these controversial issues relating to the human skin. And also creating a specific and definite regulatory framework based on the consent of the person can be a temporary remedy to protect the rights of the human skin, but it cannot consider as a sufficient remedy because of the rapid development of the biotechnologies. 
therefore we have to create or develop a theoretical foundation which can address the issue emerging in the field of law relating to the human body so as i mentioned earlier even though the human skin has acquired immense value in the market economy still the accepted principle is that people cannot have the control over their own body or no one has the right to commodity their own body or its biological parts in this context also the owner of the skin cannot gain any financial gains over his or her skin even though the third party companies own a huge amount of profits by using disembodied thank you very much uh, ms buddhika munasinghha uh, actually i also was thinking about what is a uh, human billboard in so it's regarding tattoos actually it's really really interesting Uh, it's really really interesting so uh, i hope i hope you all can hear me no okay so uh, i would like to uh, have the comments of dr ross vijay sekar regarding ms buddhika munsinghe's presentation i hope you have nice comments uh, for her presentation it's waiting for you madam <laughs> seriously unfortunately kaushani buddhika spoke a language that i hardly understood <laughs> <laughs> I, I I'm I'm clueless about uh, this uh, human billboarding and uh, this uh, laws to regulate skin of course it's it must be an emerging area uh, interesting uh, choice buddhika um, just if you can if you concluded by saying that we must uh, develop uh, or create a theoretical foundation or a theoretical basis uh, in order to improve or in order to build a law upon so uh, what would be your uh, recommendation as a as a theoretical basis what kind of a theory would best suit this law uh thank you very much madam uh, first of all i'd like to say that there are so many uh, proper proprietary theories relating to the property but when it's come to the human body no one identified human body as a property because of the notion that we are saying no one can own or no one can buy human body therefore we should go for a new uh, theory that can be based on the property law theories but it it should be and it it must be separated from from this uh, separated from uh, from this um i'm really, really sorry about this uh, technical errors madam uh, this uh, new theory should be coming through the property law theories but it shouldn't be the same as property, property law theories because if we go for a property law theories madam then definitely Uh, the commodification of human body ma bio materials can be happening that is not good for a human kind but when when if we can identify new law area like we are talking about the intellectual property law but be before that we don't have that kind of law and uh, we also talking about now we are talking about the industrial law before that we don't have that kind of laws i think now we go for a new law like this kind of law relate law of the body then we can identify uh, body theory law uh, basis on law of the body so uh, madam there are a few um, le legal luminaries are researching in this area but th this is very newly concept and there are there are uh, there are no very huge uh, legal literatures on this so i think um, according to my view and uh, the findings uh, that i have found i identified that uh, this uh, law of the body or the theory uh, some theory uh, based on the body should be come under the property law regime but be, uh, we have to separate that um, theory uh, by um, providing some kind of um, uh we have to based on the uh, humanity and also we have to think about the rights of the uh, body holders or the skin holders madam thank you very much thank you buddhika so uh, the uh, faculty of law uh, has a has a has a up and coming uh, researcher 
to add to the to the emerging area but uh, uh, i i reserve my my uh, comments with i mean how can you consider uh, somebody's skin as a property uh, it sounds quite a bit weird anyway all the best to your research uh, the adventurous uh, <laughs> research efforts thank you very much thank you thank very you. much madam thank you very much uh, dr ross vijay sekara thank you and thank you ms buddhika actually uh, unfortunately dr yashodara had to uh, leave the session due to uh, power failure we were we are still we are waiting for her but uh, she uh, i think yet to be connected so uh then we'll uh, move to the next session the last session of uh, today uh, the third se technical session so miss danushika abe ratna uh she is the probationary lecturer of the department of private and comparative law her research interest time on medical law family law women's rights and children's rights uh she's speaking today on the topic of surrogate mothering feminist analysis on enhancing or restricting freedom i hope the presentation will be very awesome and very interesting so uh ms danshika over to you for your presentation a very good afternoon dear sir madam and college i am danshika beratna uh, today my presentation is going to be on uh, surrogate mothering Uh, feminist analysis on enhancing or restricting freedom um, my presentation is going to be structured according to this dream of having their own child is a central part of human lives which is formed for a thousand of years if someone is unable to conceive by their own there are modern assisted reproductive technologies which help parents to have their own child surrogacy is one such method the literal meaning of surrogate is substitute or replacement so a surrogate mother is a substitute mother surrogacy is not a new concept and you can read stories even in the holy bible i am not going to explain those story because of the limited time the research problem of this study is to find whether the surrogate mother enhances or restricts the freedom of surrogate mothers in sri lanka under the liberal and radical feminist perspectives and these research questions will be addressed through this research this research is based only on liberal and radical feminist perspectives and also will be discussed only through the perspective of surrogate mother this is the methodology i adapted to conduct this research and i'm not going to explain this further because of the limited i adapted two different feminist views namely liberal feminism and radical feminism and there are a few reasons to choose these feminist perspectives and like surrogate mothering liberal feminism consider human beings as rational autonomous and self interested in individuals and they strongly values liberty contemporary liberal feminists focused on emphasizing reproductive rights in early years there these are the main reasons to choose liberal feminism to analyze uh, surrogate mothering and also because bodily autonomy and reproductive freedom is directly connected with the surrogate mothering and then i choose uh, radical feminism mainly because they discuss about the oppression of women by main patriarchy they are explaining that patriarchy is based in an oppression family structure within which women's sexuality and reproductive capacity are controlled one of the important points some radical feminists endorse is that the patriarchy supported violence against women and threats of violence against women particularly if women step outside the roles assigned to her in family at the end of this research you will see that the, how the patriarchy affects towards surrogate mother in, in sri lanka and also they are argued that revolution change that challenges a full range of patriarchal institutions including family needs to liberate women further the molding is speaking out and organizing for the right to choose abortion it can be argued that surrogate mothering can be considered as the other end of abortion these are the reasons to choose these two feminist perspectives to analyze the surrogate mothering and women's freedom 
First step the researcher is going to analyze the women's right to become a surrogate mother. Surrogate motherhood is directly connected with bodily autonomy. Every human being's right to life carries with it as an intrinsic part of its rights to bodily autonomy and integrity. Article 16 of CEDAW also discusses about this and the reproductive freedom. There is a general tendency in the literature to use the concept of reproductive freedom in the context of women's right to bodily self-determination or control over one's body. Do the women really enjoy the reproductive freedom? Authors like Jonathan Hill and Jesse Wall suggest that becoming pregnant as the result of a sex act between a married couple does not necessarily mean that the woman enjoyed her reproductive freedom. Even in Sri Lanka, where marital rape and abortion is not recognized, the child could be born without the consent of the mother, the woman. Compared to this situation, surrogate mothering can be claimed as enhancing the women's bodily autonomy and reproductive freedom because they are the surrogate mother can choose whether she is ready to bear a child whether she is ready to become a mother and when to make the arrangement when to make the surrogacy agreement and of course not like in the past there is no sexual intercourse involved in modern surrogacy Falston Danny mentioned that the development of artificial reproduction as a means of eliminating patriarchy by freeing women from the burden of reproduction. But in Sri Lanka, according to one of my previous researches, I will show you the results later. It was evident through a field research that to Sri Lankan surrogate women become surrogate mothers in order to help financial to her family or to support one of her female uh, family members. Uh, then the question arises is, if it is for bodily autonomy, can a surrogate mother terminate a pregnancy? Under the section 300 of the Act number 38 of uh, Children's Act, num uh, Children's Act 2005, South African mothers enjoy this right as well. They can terminate pregnancy, surrogate mothers can terminate pregnancy, but before that she should inform her decision to the commissioned parents as well. So it can be argued that due to the lack of regulatory mechanism on surrogacy, Sri Lankan women do not enjoy the, uh, her reproduction freedom and bodily autonomy to the fullest, not even in natural birth of a child uh, due to the lacuna of the laws. Lacunas in the law such as marital rape and uh, abortion and so on. When considering about social legal challenges faced by Sri Lankan surrogate mothers, there are so many. I am going to discuss a few in here because of the limited time. Kate Galloway in her paper, Surrogacy and Dignity, Rights and Relationships, stated that women's reproductive situation is never the result of biology alone but of biology mediated by social and cultural organization. The control of women's reproduction role by men is the root of patriarchal oppression. Though I was unable to conduct a field research for this paper uh, due to prevailing situation in the country, these, there are some statistics I gathered in 2017 and you can see those in the screen. I was able to contact 10 surrogate mothers and 52% of them helped their husband's family member or his family friends in surrogacy arrangements. So they become surrogate mothers only to help and only to assist her husband. The, uh, these are not purely based on kindness but sometimes by force. Another challenge faced by the surrogate mothers in Sri Lanka is financial crisis. According to the answers provided by them, 80% of them are unemployed and depending on their husband. So they have to support their family and they are choosing surrogacy agreements because it's, they think that it is an easy method of uh, gaining money. One can argue that it is okay since they are autonomous. They have their overly autonomy. But uh, the same argument uh, can bring to justify uh, prostitution. That is what we need to justify prostitution as well. But not like in prostitution, surrogacy is more complicated because it affects more parties and unborn child also there. 
It was evident through my previous field research this could lead to sexual exploitation. You can see the statistic here. Most of uh, 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 but uh, section 301 of South, uh, Children's Act in South Africa provides that there should not be financial promises with surrogacy arrangements. Though it seems to be unjust for women where bodily autonomy is there, but on the other hand, it is necessary to prevent them from exploitation. South African law provides many provisions to protect parties of the surrogacy agreements. The main challenge surrogate mothers in Sri Lanka face is a lack of regulatory mechanism. Though it is argued that the state shouldn't intervene in family issues, this issue must be addressed in order to provide the safeguard for surrogate mothers and other parties. These are few examples where surrogate mothers mention their financial needs even in the web advertisements. This is also one such example. The question is to be solved is whether surrogate mothering enhances or restricts freedom. At a glance, of course, yes, it enhances freedom. It grants women reproductive freedom, bodily autonomy and bodily integrity and so on. But Countries like Sri Lanka, where patriarchy is rooted, it is restricting women's freedom and uh, give an extra burden towards women, considering them mass baby making and money making machines. Surrogate mothering can enhance freedom if they can make informed decision by considering all the factors. For this purpose, there should be a supportive social legal background. So it can be argued that government should intervene in surrogacy agreements neither to promote nor to surrender. The, because the lack of clear and accurate information on the legal consequences of surrogacy has resulted in cases of exploitation. In order to protect Sri Lankan surrogate mothers, there should be some kind of regulatory mechanism like in South Africa. A regulatory mechanism should be established by the state to ensure the protection of surrogate mothers' bodily autonomy and adequate policies to ensure their safety and social protection. Finally, it is worthy to mention that the state should not uh, let surrogate mothers to be loud used and then forgotten which is happen more often. And thank you so much for listening to my presentation. And uh, please raise questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Danushika. It's really, really uh, thought-provoking uh, presentation and very interesting on uh, regarding surrogacy. And uh, I would like to uh, receive the comments from Dr. Ross Vijayasekar. I hope uh, she would like the presentation because of feminism aspects. Madam, uh, over to you, madam. <laughs> Thank you. I know Danushika, how passionate Danushika is about this topic. Thank uh, you. I thought you would make a live presentation. Uh, it was interesting, Danushika. I read your abstract. Um, now, you have done quite a lot of work on this area, I know. Um, I have a question for you. Now, this is to challenge you. Okay. Right? Not to not to not to let you down, but to empower you through this challenge. Now you adopt two feminist legal theories to question this. Liberal feminism, radical feminism. I'm quite comfortable with ra radical feminism being used to, to analyze this whole idea of surrogacy because radical feminists uh, focus on women's bodily integrity, the right to uh, bodily integrity, and also to have uh, regulatory framework to safeguard the protection of the right, not the protection of the body per se, but the protection of the right to bodily integrity. So it's a perfect fit. But how would you use liberal feminism to, to analyze this whole idea? Actually, I use it for men to discuss about the autonomy and integrity, all those things. But I know that liberal feminism has changed a lot with the time. 
uh, I use the uh, earliest concept for this purpose, madam. Now, but I know the contem uh, contemporary libraries have changed their mind and they are talking about something else. So I have to study further on that also. Thank you very much, madam. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Osrija Sekar, and uh, thank you very much, Ms. Danushika. So, our uh, Dr. Yashodara Kadir Gamutambe, she's back on the session now. So, uh, Madam uh, Yashodara, I hope uh, you can hear me. Madam Yashodara, uh, if you are in the session, so I would like to go for. Uh, yes, yes. I would like to go for your uh, comments regarding Ms. Janani. Uh, yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, over to you, uh, madam. Okay, actually, in Danushika's, uh, I have two questions because uh, presentation, she himself stated that right to property or right to land is not recognized in international law. And then second point, what she made was that even in domestic sphere, that right to la land is not given much importance. Yeah. So given uh, these two arguments, so I have a question about how we can argue on right to land because there is no uh, much acceptance on, you know, international human rights law as well in domestic sphere. So uh, as Dr. Vijay Sekar suggested, I would also say not to use right to land, global right to land. And again, when you take human rights aspect, uh, the um, Janani, I think you have just mentioned Article 17 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I don't know whether you went beyond uh, uh, UDHR and saw there was some controversy when, you know, they drafting the ICCPR and ICESR and they finally, they did not include the right to property in those two conventions because there are a lot of controversies about the definition because they, uh, the many states do not want the private sector come into, you know, uh, the uh, concept of right to land because uh, as you also pointed out it is uh, the right the land should be with the state because of the you know, state has to balance the interest of private interest and the public interest right then again i would like I would like to also, uh, uh, you can just look into the regional, uh, you know, convention, human rights convention. But again, you can see even if you regional convention, right to property is recognized in American convention, all those. But still, you can't say it's a universal right because those are regional instruments where, you know, all these parties. And uh, again, one more comment that when you talk about this uh, right to land, it's uh, because it's related, because human rights are interrelated and indivisible, you know. So therefore, when you, you know, see all literature relating to land rights, uh, it's talk about the other rights, right to housing, right to water, right to food, all those aspects. So therefore, I think right to land, it's uh, the, the proper definition is not given. But again, uh, there are a lot of discussions. There are a lot of discussions uh, which related to other rights. So I would ask you to look into those aspects. Even I would not agree to, you know, use this term uh, global right to lands because uh, the reasons I have pointed out, two reasons. One is the international law. Uh, they still there is a, uh, you know, uh, no, not kind of an acceptance to recognize right to property and even in the domestic sphere. But certain countries, they have uh, incorporated the constitution. Again, you can look at the United Nations General Assembly passed a resolution. Instead of including these right in these two covenants, they passed a resolution and asked the states to include right to property in the constitutions and national laws. So those are my comments to your paper. So you can look at, uh, into all those aspects, Janani. Sure, madam. Thank you very much, madam. Even I do agree with that. Uh, even I wanted to emphasize all the rights that are connected to land, not near the, merely own, owning the land. So yes. uh, I think it will be uh, the comments are very uh, useful for me to uh, upgrade my uh, research, madam. Thank you very much. Yes, Janani. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much, uh, Dr. Ashodara, for your valuable comments on her presentation. And please don't leave the session because uh, we are going to take a photograph of the departmental sessions. Uh, so give me a few minutes and I will arrange everything. So I'm being honored and thankful to our legal luminaries. 
Dr. Ross Vijay Sekar and uh, Dr. Yashodara Kadiragam Kambi to participate in our sessions today as the distinguished panel members, uh, do, uh, especially during their very busy working schedule and other commitments. So we really respect and greatly appreciate both of your thoughts um, both madams and uh, your contributions uh, given to our presenters uh, in order to develop their research work. So thank you again, uh, Dr. Ross Vijay Sekara and Dr. Shodhara Kadiragam Tambi. Thank you very much, dear madams, for your valuable support uh, to given to uh, the, uh, the, the technical sessions of the Department of Private and Comparative Law. Now, uh, before uh, concluding the session, so I would like to, uh, so we'll, uh, I, as per the request from our head of the department, so we would like to take a departmental photograph, including our dis distinguished panelists. So I would like to ask you to switch on your cameras and we'll have a few minutes to have a snap and uh, then uh, we'll have our vote of thanks. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, for presenting for the picture and uh, so uh, we we have to conclude the session now i think it's time four o'clock for ten so uh, i would like to invite uh, miss jayakala jayaratnam uh, for jayarendram sorry uh, to uh, give the vote of thanks and <coughs> after that we'll conclude the session thank you very much especially to our distinguished panelists and to our all the presenters thank you very much jayakala over to you a very good evening to all honorable dignitaries, respected vice chancellor, madam, dean, madam, heads of the departments, distinguished guests, colleagues, dear students and participants. On behalf of the Department of Private and Comparative Law, I feel immense pleasure to take this opportunity to deliver a vote of thanks to conclude the technical session of the annual research symposium 2020 of Department of Private and Comparative Law, Faculty of Law, University of Colombo, to all dignitaries assembled here. I would like to thank our chief guest, Honorable Justice Dr. Salim Masur, President's Counsel, who spared the time from his busy schedule and honored this event with his inspirational thoughts as the keynote speaker of the inaugural session today. I would like to regard our deep sense of obligation to our respected Vice Chancellor, Senior Professor Chandrika Vijayaradna Madam, for her exceptional leadership, guidance, and motivation. I take this opportunity to specially express my deep regards and gratitude to Professor Indira Nanayakara, Dean of the Faculty of Law, for always encouraging us and providing opportunities to organize such events. I would like to especially thank our respected conference chair of the Annual Research Symposium 2020 of the Faculty of Law, Professor Shanti Sagaraj Singham, for her unfaltering support, guidance, and confidence in us. I would further extend a hearty thanks to Dr. Udapadi Lenage, Head of the Department of Private and Comparative Law for her enormous support and active guidance to make this technical session of the symposium a successful event. I would like to ex express special thanks to the reviewers for their thoughtful comments and efforts towards improving the manuscript submitted by the authors in Department of Private and Comparative Law. I would like to thank the respected panelists of the technical session today, Honorable Justice S. Thurai Raja, Honorable Justice A.H.M.D. Nawaz, Professor Emeritus Sharias Carnival, Professor Kamina Gunaratna, 
ഡോക്ടർ റോസ് വിജയശേഖര് ഡോക്ടർ വിജയദാസ് രാജപക്സ പ്രസിഡൻസ് കൌൺസിൽ മിസ്റ്റർ ജോഫ്രി അലഗരത്നം പ്രസിഡൻസ് കൌൺസിൽ മിസ് ശ്യാമ സൽഗഡു and dr yashodara kadirkam tambi for sparing their time and their thoughts provoking and constructive feedback to the presenters i am sure the feedback given will definitely help the presenters to develop their research papers for the publication i would further extend a hearty thanks to mishalika aryaratna senior assistant register faculty of law for her untiring efforts valuable support and guidance in this event I would like to especially thank the staff of the UCSC University of Colombo for all this technical support and so helping us to successfully hold the technical session via Microsoft Teams. My deep sense of appreciation and gratitude go to the organizing committee and the academic and non-academic members of the Department of Private and Comparative Law for their enormous support given in various aspects of this virtual conference in successfully conducting the technical session. last but not the least i take this opportunity to thank all the dignified invitees and the participant who chose to be live with us and attended the technical session of the department of private and comparative law with great enthusiasm and made it a successful event once again i thank you all for being with us this evening have a wonderful day ahead <laughs> thank you the job well done Thank you very much, madam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Thank you, madam. And uh, I must be uh, thankful to Kaushani and Dumindu uh, for being uh, available. And madam, and madam Budhika also here. Budhika also here. Super. I was seeing around the clock, uh, but even though she is not presenting, I mean she did she have you know, the best uh, for uh, make this event a success. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Have Thank a you. have a nice Thank evening. You. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.